you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to a couple of scriptures very quickly and move into the thought that I hope the Lord will help us to bring to you. In the book of Proverbs, 17th chapter, 17th verse. The book of Proverbs, 24th chapter, and the 10th verse. You've been standing a while. I'm going to read these and let you be seated. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Let's say it together. I was born for trouble. That's what adversity means. You were born for trouble. And Job said the man is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, if you're trying to outrun trouble, you better get ready to die because you're going to have trouble. The Lord made you for it. The book of Proverbs 24 and 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. And the Lord's in the business of developing your strength to match the adversity. He's not trying to move the the adversity. He's going to help you to be strong enough to deal with it. And if you want to overcome, you have to make up your mind. You don't run. You don't hide. You don't faint. You don't give up. You just keep developing your spiritual strength until you're able to overcome. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, in... The message that I want to bring to you today, is, and I'll just give it to you in the beginning of the statement, of a, if you want to put a title to it, is that you must be an overcomer. There's no question. You've got to be an overcomer. Now that's, that's, you just have to be an overcomer. Uh, when it looks like it's too big for you, it still must be. You have to overcome. I want to read the, a scripture that I really love. To meditate on, and it's in the book of First Corinthians, the ninth chapter. This is a statement by the Apostle Paul, and let's pick it up at about the twenty-third verse. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the, the prize? So run that you may obtain. And every man that, is, that striveth for the masterous, mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, and we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others... I myself may be a castaway. And from that verse, uh, I want to call your attention. The verse that Brother Wilmoth read to you is this text. In Timothy, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecy which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. When Paul was writing to this young man that was his... Uh, developing uh, protege that's going to follow through with Paul's ministry. He's giving him instructions in the book of 1 Timothy how to fight a good war and win. I will not take the time to go into detail, but just point these points out to you. He, he says in the second chapter, I exhort that you first of all learn how to pray by supplications and prayers and intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, pray for the king, pray for the rulers. He lists many things that, that he should learn in his prayer life. Then the second chapter, he says the true saying. And he said a man desires the office of bishop. And he lays out the qualifications for a bishop. Uh, the man that's going to be uh, overseeing churches. And then he gives, gives the same thing for, these, uh, for the elders and the deacons and so forth. Then he said in the latter days there's going to be a time come when uh, they're going to give themselves over to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and so forth. And they're going to be speaking lies and, and a number of things. 
But the big thing is going to be of, of importance to you is that they will not have an ear to hear the gospel. They won't be have an ear to hear and listen. And you've got to keep on preaching when folks don't listen, when folks don't listen and obey. But all the way through, and I'll let you pick it up and study it if you will a little later, all the way through, he's constantly dealing with him as a person. He said, I, I want you to run away from, from youthful lust. I don't want you to prove how strong you are. I want you to run. If it's, if it's temptation right over here, you run over there. You know, you, you've got to run from, from immorality. Immorality, when you read the Scriptures, you'll find it wherever it says the things that can inherit the kingdom of God, the top of the list every time is the moral sins first. If you don't overcome the moral sins, you're going to go to hell. And the Bible said there's some people have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. It's because they're so consumed with immorality that they can't even get freed from it. And I'm not preaching on that, but I'm telling you right now, that's the number one enemy to your spiritual walk with God is the lust of the flesh. And then if you're going to overcome... You've got to have a desire to really overcome. Uh, you've got to do more than wistfully think about it. And Brother Huntley mentioned last night, and it's so true, if we're going to develop a group of people that's going to have to constantly run through the encouragement line every time we come to church, and we're going to pity you because you're, you're having a difficulty at school or someplace, and make a sympathy case out of it, we're going to raise a bunch of weaklings that will fall when the enemy comes because they don't have the inner structure built strong enough to resist. They're living on the edges of emotional, what I call, pleasure seekers. If there's anything to pleasure me in the church, I'll be there. But if you don't pleasure me, I'll soon lose attention, and I'll walk away. I don't have any interest there. And you don't, we don't really develop a Christian uh, in the church building itself. You instruct there. You teach there. And uh, we have to go out and prove it. On the outside. The testing areas is beyond the church. You're going to be tested and tried when there's no piano, no organ, no singer, nobody, just you and the test and God. And when you get to that spot, you discover things about yourself. And that's where the Lord tries us. And he tests us to let us see what's inside. He knows what's inside. You, you know, we always use this, this little statement, Lord, you know my heart. Hey, that's an insult to God because... He does know your heart. The fact of the matter, do I know my heart? Lord, I don't even know my heart well enough to just to make some of these statements or, that I'm going to talk about to you. And, and, but I want you, you know my heart. And now you help me to learn my heart and know what's in me. I want to be sure I'm living for God and living right. And that's what David said, and that's what the little song is about. He said, try my reins. In other words, see if I've learned how to be able that we can plow a straight row and I can listen to the, uh, to the man that's in charge. We had little words that we called G and Haw. That's when the mule learned how to go left or right. And then you used some other words for, to stop and you said, whoa. And he learned those few little things and you could get him to walk down the middle. We had an old mule once in a while who would walk on the cotton. And you've got to get her off the cotton because really she's stomping it. And you could give her a little yank on the line and, and say, get off that cotton. And uh, the old mule gets down in the middle. Now, a mule's got enough sense to know where you want them to walk, and they'll do it. The Lord said, uh, David said one place, I believe it was him that mentioned that he would guide me with his eye. Now, when you get that far along that you don't need the reins, all you have to have is to look. You're really getting close enough to know what he's thinking. You get the mind of Christ. It's not a matter then of you learning how to just be yanked around. We used to have an old mule. You had to just yank him around to make him turn at the end and go back the other direction. He wanted to go to the barn all the time. You had to pull on the reins. Then you took the reins and swatted him one. Now, there is a difference in developing a person to become something he doesn't want to be. Or you're developing something that somebody has a vision to become. It's a big difference. In the war we just had with Hussein, he has 150,000 troops behind the other 400,000 to make sure they fight. So when the battle begins to get hot and heavy, 
the ones that don't want to fight, said to our fellows, I thought you'd never get here. When you really don't want to fight, you're waiting for some place to give up on, some excuse to give up and walk out. And yet some way you've got your feelings hurt and you got away and you could blame the church, blame somebody, and so on. But if you notice that the men that were on our side and put together, I noticed our leader, the president, kept telling us exactly why we're there, the purpose of why we're there. The reason that we are in this predicament is because, 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 and that righteousness and judgment demands some corrections. Now, you've learned a few things if you watch that. But I want to go into the area for you to see that sometimes we're looking at conquering the world and we look at for the outreach, and that's fine. And I want you to keep that. But if I don't build the inner man strong enough, you might build a church of 10,000, but you yourself could fall away and be lost. We saw some big TV evangelists that took a tumble. They didn't take a tumble. They were doing that all along. They were that way all the time. And there was nobody to check on it, nobody to help them to find and see their needs. They were, they were disqualified to even preach the message, what, whatever. But they did it for years and gained a crowd. Now, the Lord's not building a church on television evangelist or up on some man's name. He's building a church on his own name. And he's going to train you and me to be in that church. Now, he's looking for individual commitments. Each one of us makes a commitment. And this is what has impressed me so much, is the fact that when I look in the Scripture, every... Every incident, wherever someone was given a position that they were not prepared for, they failed. They didn't make it. Lucifer had everything you could think to give into his, uh, into his hands to be a success. He was born perfect, created perfect. He was created with the best looks, and he was uh, beautiful to look upon. He was talented. He was born with it. Talented people many times are lazy folks because they don't put their best out. They can get there too easy without doing too much practice. Some folks, well, I don't know how I ever practice. It means that you don't want to develop beyond what you've been doing. If this is your level, you ought to be going to this level. Sometimes we compare ourselves by ourselves and think, well, I'm doing better than he is. Don't look at that. God mapped out your course for you. You follow that course. And the Lord wants you as young people to realize He's got a plan for your life right now. I don't believe for one moment it's going to be developed later on in life. It's right now, if you can recognize that. And I noticed that uh, Lucifer, perfect, but he failed. Then God turned around and made Adam. He was very good. The Bible said he was good, very good. I just believe that... Adam had everything he needed, and it was all perfect, perfect environment. But he failed. And then I see Israel, and he's about to make a nation out of them. He grabbed a hold of Saul when he was out looking for the donkeys. And I don't know who was looking for who, but there wasn't much difference between the two. The Bible said that this man, tall, handsome, no training, no developing, no proving, and you put him into the king's palace. He makes a fool of himself. You're not fit for the kingdom if you can't be tested. If you're praying for some kind of miracle to make you perfect, it'll never happen. Perfection comes by one step at a time, one walk at a time, one day at a time. You're going to learn how to live for God in the monotony of everyday life. It's not just in the crowd that we're going to see what I'm talking about. It's when you go home, you and the living God have a communication with Him. I want to serve you, Lord. I want to learn of you. I want to know you. I want to fellowship you so you can teach me how to walk and how to talk and how to live. So when the Lord went to build a church, He didn't make it perfect to start with. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to build it. You don't build something just by waving the hand. It's piece by piece. Two before by two before. Nail by nail. 
And that's how God's going to build your life to become a temple of the Holy Ghost. I want to look at you personally today, not so necessarily so much of the church as a whole, but recognize God is developing my life. There's some things He must take out of my life, and there's some things He must put into my life. And the Bible says we have to be an overcomer. In the world, Paul said that people do the same thing. I just in the last issue of the Reader's Digest, it was quite interesting to read of this young lady, Anna Perez. If you might have read the little, little spot here. Uh, she was raised in a poor home. she come home one day, and her mother and the children were kicked out into the street, evicted. She had to be put in the home of others for a while. But she made some statements about her mother. She said, but no matter, she said, I live in the fifth grade teacher for a while, but no matter how bad things got, my mother made it clear that we were not defined by our financial situation. We were defined by our abilities to overcome it. In the world, they know that. And this woman said she is the secretary to the president's wife, Barbara Bush. And she mentioned one little statement I thought was quite unique. She said, one of the best things that ever happened to me on this job is whenever my kids come to see me, they have to come to the White House. Out of poverty, she was able to overcome. I like people who's got enough get up and go. They don't lay down and die. I like somebody who's got some grit in their gizzard. They don't quit. They don't stop. We've got people today that's judging you by the size of the car and the kind of car you drive. The kind of house you live in. There's some great men that live in this world that lived in poor bodies. Some of them couldn't hear very well. Some didn't have a good eyesight. Some were sickly in body. But they've made some of the best music the world's ever heard. They give us some of the greatest philosophers the world's ever heard. I'm here to tell you, even in the world, that if you overcome a handicap, it puts inside of the people's respect for you that you wasn't just handed a silver spoon and blessed you with riches. Riches is a curse. You need to earn them. John D. Rockefeller made those kids give an account for their budget. In those days, he gave him a quarter a week. He's a millionaire. He's going on to be a multimillionaire. Someday he'll be a billionaire. But he's raising some children. He doesn't want them to be spoiled with money. So he gives them a little allowance. They give an account for every nickel they spent. And he gave them so much to be an accountable for it. The richest man in the, in the times of my life turned around and told his kids, you've got to be able to earn money. And I'm here to tell you that Pentecost is not here serving you a free dish, friend. You're going to pay the price for it. You're going to pray it yourself. Not somebody else going to pray it for you. You're going to pray through. You're going to seek the Lord. You're going to overcome. You're going to fight. You're going to live, you're going to live for God because you want to. And I noticed that in, in life itself, this is built in so much of the fiber of sport world. A man was competing in a long, I don't know how many miles of long distance swimming it was, and he came in second. But what was so remarkable about it, he only had one arm. There's a man that went through this, uh, what they call Handicap Olympics. He came in hours and hours later than anybody. But there's a crowd waiting for him. Because at least he did finish. He wasn't a quitter. He didn't stop. There's got to be some stamina put in this thing. I want to see the Holy Ghost put something in you individually. That you get your own consecration. You get your own vision. You get your own dedication. You and God make that proposition. And the Holy Ghost will help you to overcome any obstacle. Name off your problems. That means you've got every one of them to overcome. And if you'll do it. God will anoint you. The same issue, I noticed where a young girl was in the mountains hiking and got hit by lightning. When she finally discovered her situation, her legs are numb. She cannot even move them. She crawls on the ground, dragging those numb limbs for about a mile to get to a road. She found a big tree in the way. She said, how can I do it? Something happened to her way back when she was in high school, I believe it was. And uh, she was about to drop out as a, some kind of sport she was in. And the coach said, are you going to be a quitter all your life now? 
And she said, I just made up my mind, no, I won't, I'll finish it. And though she didn't want to, she did it. And then she finally discovered herself facing that log out in the mountains and nobody knew, knew where she was. And her body was burned and her legs were numb and she's groveling on the ground. But she kept telling herself, but I've got to get there. I've got to make it. And she didn't know how to get over that big log. She discovered a way of making herself get over that log. And she got on the other side of it. And then it went on to see finally somebody found her and took her to the hospital. To end the story, let you see what the essence of it was. When she finally got into the uh, hospital area, got taken care of, she made this statement. I have proven to myself I'm not a quitter. Hallelujah. Oh, God, give me somebody that's got some drive. I mean some consecration that you won't quit every time the weather changes. You don't give up when nobody shows up. You don't stop because somebody won't run. You won't let the world interfere with you and God. We need some apostolic winners. I believe that's where it's at. It's when you individually make your consecration and your difficulties may be in front of you. And the Holy Ghost will help you. But let me read you something that inspired me. General Brother Douglas MacArthur in the Philippines during the Pacific War wrote this about his son. I, I'm quite a, I guess, a fan of his. I don't know much about him as a person other than what I've read. But I did like the fact that he always recognized God in a lot of things. And he was quite impressive to me in the way he handled the battle of the Pacific. He had a strategy that saved a lot of lives. And then we called upon him to go to Korea. And he said, I was never called upon to fight a war that I wasn't supposed to win. I wasn't trained that way. I was trained to win the least amount of casualties as soon as possible. When he devised that unique plan of coming in at Inchon, when the high tide once a year comes into such a place, we could bring the big ships in and we'd attack from Pusan and go into Seoul. When he devised that plan, everything clicked together. We got men up there to cut the, the armies off in the, in, the, in the south. And they had to disband, as it were, and head back to North Korea. After all of that, our politician undermined them and uh, allowed the enemy a privilege that they could come across the Yellow River and bomb us and send thousands of people over there to war against our innocent fellows that didn't even know they were coming. But I'm here to tell you something. That old general knew a few principles that was, that was really drilled into him. And that was you don't substitute anything for victory. You don't substitute anything for victory. Come on, don't, don't cut short your victory. Sometimes you're dealing with your flesh, you're dealing with your mind, you're dealing with your attitude, you're dealing with the flesh, lust, you're dealing with the eyes that's lustful. You can't compromise one iota. You've got to have the victory. There's no compromise in this war. You must have the victory. And he said, I was never taught to fight like that. He'd been through several wars. The Spanish War, Philippine War, uh, World War War, World War II, name it. He knew what war was. But he also recognized there's principles that you have to fight for. And if you don't have those principles, your soldiers don't have no desire to really go. Build me a son. Oh, Lord, who will be strong enough to know when he's weak, brave enough to face himself when he's afraid, one who will be proud and unbending and honest to feet, and humble and gentle in victory. Build me a son whose wishes will not take the place of deeds, a son who will know thee, that to know himself is the foundation stone of knowledge. Lead him, I pray, not in the paths of ease and comfort, but under the stress and spur of difficulties and challenge. Here let him learn to stand up in the storm. Here let him learn compassion for those who fail. Build me a son whose heart will be clear, whose goals will be high. A son who will master himself before he seeks to master other men. One who will reach into the future and yet never forget the past. And after all these things are his, add, I pray, enough of sense of humor, so that he may always, so that he may always be serious, yet not take himself too seriously. Give him humility so that he may always remember the simplicity of true greatness. 
the open mind of truth and wisdom and the meekness of true strength, then I, his father, will dare to whisper, I have not lived in vain. That's a man talking about an earthly corruptible crown. That's all it'll reach. The sports world, they exploit all these challenges. It's just a corruptible crown. And I'm here to tell you, I don't think we should back away from making the same kind of commitments for our spiritual walk with God. That the captain of our salvation, that we serve, we've got a vision and a love and devotion to Him that we don't love not our lives even unto death. This is something we're going to have to learn in America. We've been coddled. We've had plenty. We had five years of drought. How many prayed and thanked God for the rain already? Let's thank Him right now. I want you to know He sent the rain. Not the government. The Lord sent that rain. Thank you, Jesus, for the rain. But what I want you to notice is that the, the God I'm talking about is able to make you able to fight the faith, the battle of faith and win it. It's not how strong you are. It's how much you believe in what he said he could do. And he is the victory, even our faith. I'd like to drop these little thoughts to you while I'm on the, the natural line of this. Not everything has to be big to be strong. And I want you to notice that the Holy Ghost can make you strong while you're still weak in a lot of other ways. I mean by that, you may be handicapped in, in various ways. It doesn't matter what that problem may be, but the Lord can make you strong if you let Him develop you. And listen to this. A flea can jump 200 times his length. A man has to jump 1,200 feet to equal that. A house fly takes 440 steps to travel three inches. He does it in a half a second. If a man would do that, he must run 20 miles in a minute. An ant can lift a load many times his own weight. If a man would be equal to that, he must lift a diesel locomotive and carry it on his back. Turnip seeds can grow and, under good condition and increase 15 times a minute. I don't know how they found out, but I, I'm glad they found it out, not me. In rich soil, it could increase their weight. 15,000 times a day. I could go on and read you some more of these, but I'm trying to help you to understand that God didn't put strength all together in the bigness of something. He made the ant to carry. I believe this. Well, I know the beetle has been made to carry 850 times their own weight. Now, I want to draw you a comparison. If God can make these little things... To bear things bigger than what they are physically, you better get your eyes on that kind of a God that can take where you are and help you to bear loads 850 times your weight. You were made for trouble. You were made for adversity. And Paul said, I fight every day. I'm here to tell you whether you're a sinner or a Christian. It doesn't make any difference. You've got to fight to live in this world. There's so many things geared against your own life. The automobile outside, the traffic light, the lightning in the sky. Now all works against you. If you don't have no will to live in this world, you'll die quick. But if you're going to live, you've got to rise up and say, I've got to take care of living and fight a good fight while I'm here. And when you lose the will to fight, you die. And I've come to the place, it's time we, we match the physicals that the world has out there. They practice for all these sports people to do their thing. And they go out and prepare for it and all the rest of that. It's about time we learn the fact that being a Christian is just as much developing spiritual strength and spiritual senses and spiritual muscles as it is for the world to run their races outside. I don't know how to help us to get the vision as it really is. But everybody that does come back changed. I had the privilege of hearing a few people that come near death. Friend, it converted them that life is precious. Oh, yeah, you can think, well, I don't, wait a minute. When you brush death itself and you face it and stare it in the face, there's something when you come out of that struggle, you come back and say, oh, thank God for every day I breathe my breath. 
Thank God for the sunshine. Thank God for the trees. Oh, I want to go and appreciate some folks today. I was almost dead yesterday. Let me ask you to stop and think with me now, young people. The Lord wants to make your life so fulfilled that there's no burden, no barriers, no obstacles that you're going to be afraid of. That He'll give you faith and take out fear and put confidence in you that you're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, we build a big thing on how powerful we are in the fact of what we can see God do, the miracles. And I want to ask you to stop and go back to the book of Corinthians, the first Corinthians 13 chapter. Look at that chapter. We're all struck by power things. We always ask a question, how big is it? How much does it cost? How deep is it? How, how wide is it? We're always measuring things in our concepts as to how the size of something is. But notice, it says the first part of that 13th chapter that all the power gifts you can think of. You've got all wisdom. You've got all knowledge. You've got all the faith. You can move the mountains. You can do great and mighty miracles. And the Bible said if you had all of that and you don't have love or charity, it profits you nothing. And I'm on the real thing right now. now nothing wrong with the gifts. But remember, gifts that's operated in the flesh will cause you trouble. But notice the 13th chapter is between the 12th and the 14th. If we get deeper in the 12th chapter, the 14th chapter will make more sense to us. But some folks are trying to get the powers, how strong I are, how spiritual I am, the things that I have mystical thoughts about things. Let me tell you something. Walking with Jesus Christ and knowing Him and loving Him is what I really want. You may, you may call my name off, give my name and address. It doesn't impress me one bit. The Holy Ghost didn't tell me that you had to come along and tell me my name and address and give me all of that to make me believe that God's Almighty, He could heal my body. The Bible said, He said, I'm the Lord God that healeth thee. I don't need to know how much faith you've got. I've got to have much, my faith in Him. It's in Him, in Jesus we have faith. But look at the Scripture, if you will. The whole bottom part of that chapter doesn't mention how much I love God in that chapter. It's how much I love each other. My problem is not with God. It's with each other. Long-suffering and being kind. Not jealous. Not envious. If I can see it right, young people, if that is not the picture of what the real need is today, I don't, I don't know what it really is. I'm going to sum it down. I did this before. I want you to see it again. I don't think for one moment... You're going to be saved unless you know what you're competing against. Sometimes folks almost put an imaginary boundary out there and feel like they can't, they can't help it. Yes, you can. Let me stop a bit. If you're playing with pornography, now just hold steady. I don't even want an expression. If you're playing with pornography... If you're playing with the lusting of your flesh, this runner is way ahead of you. This is called the lust of the flesh. What it does, it makes you think on those things all the time. Everything you see is converted into that lustful eye. <clears throat> and then if you're caught up with the spirit of the world, I mean the, the latest, the spirit of the age then this runner is ahead of you. That is the, that's the world. Now, don't even talk about the devil. He's not much to overcome. He's defeated already. But what you don't understand is you're interpreting because you've got the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life and you've got the world to contend with, you think that's the devil. No, that's from within you. The devil has nothing to do with that. I want to teach you that you don't fight the devil. And love this. He'll give you plenty of slack. The biggest battle you're going to fight is the lust of the flesh because you live in that flesh. And that flesh was born after our father the devil. And after our earthly beginners called Adam. I've got to have a new nature. My nature's got to change. 
This idea that if I come to the doctrine of water baptism in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Ghost, i got a ticket to heaven. you just begun to get your nature changed when you repented. You're not through yet. God's going to work on you every day you live. Paul said, I run this race to win it. What race? To fight the flesh and keep it under subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I'd be a castaway. There is no human being that doesn't have to fight his mind. Fight all these different things that we're talking about. It is naturally all over the world. It's in the human family. But let me tell you, I was born again. I found a new Christ, a new, a new, a new way in Christ. I found, I got a new nature in knowing Him, but I also found out that my old nature wants to still rule my life. It still wants to lead me astray. It still wants you to look this way and that way. I must not ever forget the battle it never ceases. Keep this flesh under subjection. You can shout and still look at pornography. You can shout and listen to watch the television programs. Now, let me tell you something. This idea of thinking that because some preachers have got to the place, they go to back to re-examine the little standards we've got, which is very minimal. They're, not, they're the first graders or the kindergartners. When it comes to leaving the world, that's first grade. That's the first, first step. And then as far as... The doctrine of our little standards of you girls don't cut their hair, that's a minor thing. But they want to go back and re-examine that. It tells me that you're more lost now than you were when you found God. I'm not saying, I'm trying to show you. When you're deceived to think that what you once believed, and you go back now and undo that belief, and your elders has declared it, and you took the other turn the other direction, then something is wrong when you're out of step with the main body. <laughs> uh, I do want, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize this factor so you don't get misunderstand this. That no matter what the battle is over, it doesn't have to be that. You may not watch television, you may not have pornography, you may not have any of those th things at all. But you're dealing with your attitude, your nature. Now don't give up on yourself. The Holy Ghost can help you to win the race over each one of these. The Lord is able to help you. I don't think for one moment He expects you to lose. No, sir. But you must overcome. You have seen others stay in the same place. They've had the same experience. Have one year's experience 25 times. They haven't gone any further than they were 25 years ago. But young people, let me tell you, if you'll get a hunger in your heart to know Jesus Christ, a desire in your soul to learn about Him, don't worry about so many of these ifs and ands and, and question about things that people bring to your attention, but get your eyes on knowing Him, loving Him. You'll discover living for God is not a bunch of don'ts. It's open doors to glory and power and victory and joy, and contentment, and a clean conscience, a clean mind. And that's worth a whole lot. It really is. The devil tortures you with guilt when you're playing around the edges. Now, I'd like to get to the part that I want to spend a little more time on. How can you do it? You know, there's, there's several things I've learned from fellows in the world that did some of their deeds because that they did. You know, the, the struggle sometimes is in our mind that we think we can't. And don't be always plagued with the idea. I've heard somebody say, well, will I ever, ever get so I don't have to fight that? No. Don't pull your troops home yet. The war's still on. The moment you quit fighting, you'll succumb. Stay in there. Well, praise the Lord. I got a little book here a while back that really helped me with the comparison. Man decided that he'd like to be able to do something that he'd never done before. And he said, I wanted to climb the Matterhorn. And he said, in order to do that, uh, I had to start preparing for myself. Two years before the Matterhorn, he started running around the block, then two blocks, three blocks, five miles, ten miles, and he went under rigorous recreational training. He studied all he could study. He'd done some mountain climbing. He knew a little bit about it. He had some experience. But he discovered that if I'm going to tackle the big thing, I need a guide. So he, when he went over to Europe, he looked for a guide. He found a man he thought he wanted he would like to have, but he discovered that the man was not 
for sale. You couldn't buy him. He said, rather than you looking me over, I'm going to look you over. Whether I want to take you to the Matterhorn. Because my life is going to be in my hands. I don't want somebody not prepared to climb the Matterhorn. He questioned him and had several conferences with him. Took all of his resumes and everything that he had. Got acquainted with him. Finally, one day, he said, I'll take you. Then he said, but there's, there's some ground rules that we must get established before we ever start. One of them is that I'm leading you to the Matterhorn. And that means... You do everything I say without asking a question. That I don't want you asking the question why. When I'm up on that mountain, it's going to be cold and windy. And I tell you to do something, I don't want to stop and argue with you about it. Just remember, I've been up there many times. I know my business. I know how to do it. And if you want me to go with you, you have to take the orders. He said, yes, sir. He named off some other things. But that was one that was very important. He discovered that while he was climbing the mountain, the Matterhorn with this man, he discovered that he was, he was getting no feelings in his fingers and they were freezing. He had his proper gloves and what have you on it. And at a certain point, climbing up the side of that mountain, he tied himself around and started pulling his glove off to rub his fingers. The man rebuked him severely and said, you don't ever take those gloves off. Put your hand back in that glove and take it and hit it against the rock of the mountain here. Hit it like this. He said, I found out that that brought tingling back into my hand. In fact, it brought circulation back in there. I was hitting it so hard against the rock. He said, when I began to go up a little higher and began to get to where it was really mountain climbing, and the base camp is below us, and from here on out, there's no more people taking baggage for us. It's just going to be me and him from here on out. And I'd like to just draw some, some comparison to tell you something here. I believe this place is in Christ that I want to go. I know I do. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to scale those mountains. I'm looking for some people that have been there before. You don't find many. It's a very hard place to find folks. It's gone beyond the average kind of camp meeting services, the average kind of church service, the average kind, the average kind, the average kind. The average. We are all so used to the average that we stay at the base camp and we look at the Matterhorn and say, well, well I sure would like to go there, but we're going to stay in the base camp. There's got to be some young people be raised in this generation that's got a bigger vision than what we've got. There's got to be some young people raised in this generation that will climb the higher heights and seek the Lord and know Him better than this generation does. God never regresses us. It's always progressive. I'm amazed how that when we talk about the computer and we talk about the lasers and we talk about those fellows bombing over there and putting it down through windows and through doors and we're just so amazed by it all and those fellows are flying those jets are in their early 20s those young fellows have been raised on those kind of things until it's just ordinary for them for me it would be a big 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 problem and I'm here to speak to you young people there's some things might have been a big problem for my generation but you've come along with a greater vision and the mighty God's going to show himself greater to you than any else because the last days will be the best days the last hours will be the most important hours this world's ever seen we need some young people that's got enough zeal and burden to say Lord I want to climb a Matterhorn I want to go beyond where I've been I want to leave the crowd I want to leave the little groups the little clicks and the little carnal chit chats the little primping the little fixing the little giggling and little carrying on and, and the macho this and comb my hair a certain way and put it back here and put my comb in my pocket. Let me tell you, friend, we've got so fleshly conscious of how we look. It's about time we get to look into the living God and see what He looks like. Oh, God, awaken us to hunger and a thirsting for the living God. Not for a church program. Not for what we see we've been used to. And I love it all. It's wonderful. But let me tell you what. You don't develop a mountain climber in an auditorium reading the book. He's got to go in the mountains. So he said, uh, all the months of training, physically making myself ready, I discovered when I climbed this mountain, I needed every bit of it. All that was testing grounds back there. That was testing grounds back there. So I'm saying, young people, don't, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't make a big deal out of it. Maybe you don't have that certain kind of girlfriend or boyfriend that somebody else has. Forget it. Let the Holy Ghost give you a companion. Let the Holy Ghost give you the right one. You seek the Lord. You draw nigh to God. You seek His face. God's got a plan for you. You don't have to go out and muff it like Sarah did. No. 
Bless your heart. He wants you to have the very best for this age, and we'll need it. We'll need it. He said, after a while, when we left the base camp and began to hit some of the higher crags and the rocks and the mountains where we was going to go to the Matterhorn, he lost sight of the Matterhorn because the mountain he was climbing was right in his face. But in his mind, he saw a Matterhorn, a Matterhorn. You've got to get a vision that's beyond your trouble. You've got to get a vision that's beyond yourself. You've got to get a vision that includes the touch of God, the miraculous. You've got to get a vision that's impossible. Because you, you can see the miracles of God make manifest. And after a while, they come to a ledge. He said it jutted out over the mountain. And he, he, I mean, uh, that would be something to imagine to get around that thing. They had to go out and come back around and go over. I don't, I don't, he described it, but I can't understand it. I don't know to this day how they could do that. But when he got to there, he was always in front of me. He was always ahead of me. And I could see him do it. And he called back down for me. Do this. Now, put your foot a little more to the left. He guided him up every step of the way. I want to tell you, my Jesus will guide every step of the way. Don't get weary. Don't faint, young lady. Don't faint, young man. He's got, he's got you in his hands. And he, he said, I did everything that he said. Then there came a time that he said he had to leave the rock and be suspended. With nothing but the experience of my guide. And there's times that you're going to think, God, I'm hanging in nowhere. He said, no, I got the rope. God, I'm going to fall. No, I'm, I'm holding you. And friend, when you let go of solid position to swing out in space with the thousands or so feet down below you, and death is at the end of the trail, you've got to have a lot of faith in that man up there on top of that mountain. And I'm saying to you, young people, you need to love your pastor. You need to love the mothers in Israel. You need to love the, the people of faith in the church. Don't look for the party goers and the, and the good timers. And I'm not saying you can't have some of that as far as enjoying that. But I am saying you don't build it on that. You want somebody that's got some trophies hanging in the walls over here. You want somebody that's lived for God under adversities. Uh, somebody that can pray with you and help you to win over your difficulty, over your problem. <clears throat> After they had scaled it, got above it, only a few hundred feet to the top. And it was not the worst to climb from there on. They finally got out to the point. Where he said, this is the top of the Matterhorn. And he said, uh, you have 20 minutes to stay here because we must get down before dark. Two years and 20 minutes to view it all. He took his camera out. The wind's blowing. It's cold. And this is the result of two years. Thousands of dollars he spent paying the packers to bring up to the camp and paying this man and paying my plane ticket, missing my job. And then I got 20 minutes to survey it. So I made myself enjoy 20 minutes being on top of the Matterhorn. And then he said, now it's time to go back down. He said, this time you'll go first. Me? First? He said, yeah, you go first this time. I went up first, but you go back first. It's a lot scarier being the first one down. He'd learned to trust him on the way up. The Bible said, Paul said, I know how to abound, and I know how to be abased. I've learned the latter. It doesn't matter where you are on the ladder. He's still the same. He's still the same. Why don't we learn? Why don't we seek? Why don't we get a hunger in our heart? You can't develop yourself just in a youth convention. It inspires you. That's what it's here for. But when you go home, would you take somehow and be alone with you and God? Start learning how to seek after His face. Don't try to climb the Matterhorn when you get home. Just try to climb a few mole hills that you built for yourself. Uh, try to conquer a few little difficulties in your spiritual attitude. Uh, make yourself a better servant at the house and at the home. Be more faithful to the house of God. Do the little things until you grow into it. You're going to have to overcome, or you can't make you a winner. Now, how do you do that? I've heard people say, well, my conviction is this, 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 and this. And to this day, I can't really think and feel that I've got all the definition that clears my mind of what a conviction is. Now, I've seen some folks come in to get a license, and they said, well, do you believe our doctrine according to the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they begin to lose out with God, and they want to go out and flirt with the Charismatics and with Larry Lee and a few bunch of those fellows, and they want to walk off out on that side. They said, I never did believe it. So what helped me is this. You don't have a conviction. You just agree 
to get what you want. You don't have a conviction unless you know why you believe it. You never have a conviction unless you really believe in what you believe in, that you put your life in that position. Conviction is not a convenience. Conviction is a hard to describe. You say, you believe the message. That's not conviction. Because we can educate the head, and conviction is of a heart. And I'm afraid we've taught the standards to our people in their head, but they haven't learned to love it. Young people, you learn to love everything you're doing for Jesus Christ. If you don't understand the standards, seek to you know why we have that. You know why it's there. If you get a conviction of why it's there, the purpose of why it's there, God will give you the strength of a Daniel that you can purpose in your heart. I'm going to be this way if I went to Timbuktu and nobody does it. I'm doing this because I believe it, because it's in my heart, because I love it. It's in me. It's in me. We've got to put something inside of you, young lady, young man. That's more than just a belief. I try to describe a belief in this way. Now, you've heard me give it, but it fits. When this fellow walked back and forth across a tight wire between two buildings, he got in the inside of one side. He said, he just wheeled a wheelbarrow across it. He asked these folks in this room, uh, how many believe I can wheel this wheelbarrow back across that wire again? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, okay, somebody get in it then. That's conviction. They believed he could do it. But conviction is, I'll get in the wheelbarrow. There's a young lady that did do that. He got in there. He married her. If she could trust him that much, she must be all right. I'm here to tell you, when you have a conviction, you'll get in the wheelbarrow. If you're hitting the crowd and nobody knows the difference, then when you're all among the, your friends... Or among the other crowd out there, they don't know the difference either. No, sir. When you walk that tight wire, everybody below sees you. They see you, and they know you. Now, you know, the hard thing about this is that what I'm going to give you is just definitions. I won't have time to work on it. And besides that, I'm still working on it. I was flying home from the general conference this last year, and in a magazine, I don't know what the name of the Oh, it's called Sky. And in that magazine, there's an article about a psychologist trying to discover why... People with convictions seem to be changing the world. Not believers, people with convictions. And he said, we begin to wonder why such a small group could affect so many people. He said, they're fanatical. They go out in the streets. They do all these kind of things. He said, we begin to wonder what makes that and wh how do you describe that? Well, it got my attention because I've been looking for a definition for conviction for a long time. Now, if it's really a conviction, it's something that won't leave you overnight. But let me give you the definitions, and then you can get the tape and go back over it. There's a difference between a belief and a conviction, and they discovered that. If you went out here tonight, today, first thing you'd run into is a Gallup poll that tries to find out what everybody's thinking. And so if enough thinks this way, that's the way they're trying to say that uh, we're going and what's going to happen. Well, but they said but the Gallup poll is faulty because we don't know who's talking about what. It's a fictitious number. But how do you take a belief in something and make it into a conviction? And that's where the real struggle came. And he did give me some definitions that I'm working on and scripturally trying to find some answers for it. The first thing about it, he said, is you've got to really feel passionate, fervent about what your convictions are. It cannot be mediocre. It's got to be a passionate fervor. It's beyond the average of just saying, I like it. Peter, you love me? I like you. Peter, do you really love me? Oh, I'm really fond of you. He wasn't, he wasn't interested in any of that. He finally had to bring it down that third time. Do you really love me? Which means, is there a conviction in your heart that you know me well enough that you've got something inside of you that you can say that you love me? He said, then feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Oh. Somewhere along the three levels of our answering the Lord about our love and devotion, sometimes we've never discovered that deep one, that one way down deep. If you don't have a fervency about it it's just an accepted tolerated belief it's not a conviction you'll sell it you can give it away you can violate it and repent of it and don't feel too bad because everybody's doing it that's not a conviction then it, he went on to try to describe it a little better and give me a little better uh, i suppose uh way he's thinking about it he said it's most obvious that in many areas that people lack the persuasion. They haven't been really sold. They're not sold. Now watch this now. 
How many are sold on this doctrine? How many are sold on this doctrine? And nobody? I'm not going to trick you. I'm just asking, how many are sold on this doctrine? Do you really believe in the doctrine that brought you to, to, to salvation? We'll go back to the ABCs. Repentance, baptism, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you convinced that that's the Bible and that's the only way of salvation? Do you believe that that's the plan of God? Do you really believe that? Now, if you really believe that, here comes somebody up and says, I don't believe that. I believe if you confess your sins and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Now, if that happens and it changes your mind, then you have no conviction about that. If that happens and it makes you mad, you don't have no conviction about it. It's a prejudice. But if that happens that way, it doesn't bother you one bit for you believe it or not, friend. But that's the book. That's the Bible. That's the way it is. And that's the only way you're going to get to heaven. It means that you're not persuaded. You can't take you away from what you've been persuaded on once you get a conviction. If you haven't got a good conviction, you don't, you're not persuaded yet. And I wonder, young people, I don't want you to feel embarrassed about this. If you're not fully persuaded about it, you need to study the Word of God. Get somebody to help you with the Word of God. Go to your pastor. Get somebody to help you and get a full knowledge of what the truth really is. You can't have conviction on anything less than the full knowledge of the truth. I come in on a day when it was a day of intimidation. They call it hard preaching and a lot of it was just railing on people. And it was intimidation to get you to do something. I didn't know why we were supposed to do it. It just intimidated you, intimidated. Hey, wait a minute. Tell me why. Let me understand the Scripture. Give me the standards of living godly, soberly, and righteously. I want to live for God. It's not that I don't want to do it, but tell me how and what it is. And you should know it. Now, if you're arguing the point, then you're not persuaded. I'm saying... This man said, when you're fully persuaded in the cause or in the position, you can start developing convictions. And then he went on to uh, explain another couple of points. Let me give you another one here that really impressed me. Now, he said, the next thing is you, you've got to be willing to take actions on behalf of that conviction. You can't believe it and not take action. Did you ever see these, they call them activist placards, stopping folks in the Bay Bridge? All right. That's what he's talking about. Not that you go out and do it that way. That's what we're, talk we're not talking about that. But you have a feeling that you can't just believe it and not do something. You have to do something about it. If we have a conviction about soul winning, we have to do something. If you've got a conviction about something that's wrong, you must do something about it. It's a conviction. That's how you develop it. Then he went on with this one here that I think is really good. He said, you're willing to go out on a limb... Even if it's socially embarrassing to you, even at the risk of your friends misunderstanding you, you can't change. It's in you. He said that's how you develop a conviction. Now, here's another point that I feel like is very important to that conviction. You must have something to trigger or catapult you in to knowing that you have a conviction by having something to test it for you. You won't know how much you've got till you're put in that position. Daniel didn't know how much he had until he saw himself. I can't eat this food. He knew he couldn't eat this food. He could have given a thousand excuses, perhaps. But lo and behold, he come to the fact that this is, this is wrong. And by knowing that, he put his feet down, as it were, and was willing to take the consequences and to violate his own conscience. And you're willing to step out in spite of what it costs you? You take a stand for it. You don't feel like backing up on it. It's strong enough inside of you. If, it's, if it means that I lose a friend, or if I lose this or lose the other, I'd rather have my conviction clean and pure than to go violate it and live under condemnation. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You have to overcome, and the way you overcome is build some conviction deep enough inside your spirit. One other thing about it, he said... You're always talking about it. You're always talking about it. It's in you. You talk it. Somebody doesn't like it. Oh, you've got a pet subject of mine. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You don't stand and, and beat around the bush. You know where you stand. You know what you are. That's a conviction. We need some young people that can stand up at school or the friends in the neighborhood or wherever. Don't let them push you around. You know more Bible than they know. 
the doctrine in the word of the Lord is in you, you can take your stand. Praise the Lord. You'll just come to the music here in closing. You've got to have something that triggers it. I was in my home one day when I just early part of my ministry, and I had a chart that somebody had. I was trying to copy the thing, and it, part of the chart had hell on it. And uh, you used to have a chart to show you what hell looked like. And I, I don't know who wrote the chart even, but anyway, it was hell on there. This girl came in, Jehovah's Witness, and I knew she didn't believe in hell. So I just made it very sure before we got too far along the conversation that I brought up hell. She said, I don't want to believe that. And she packed up her stuff, and then she began to throw some scriptures at me that I never thought about. Hey, they got some arguments now. And, they, and she threw some, some questions to me. I tell you what, it triggered something in me. But I better see what I do believe about hell. I made a brand new study in the Bible about hell, whether I believed in hell or didn't believe in hell. I thought I believed in hell. But she had some arguments that threw me. I'm here to tell you, it's good to go back to the book. Reaffirm your faith. Know whereof you stand. Put your feet down. We can all shout together we believe something here. But when you're out there just eyeball to eyeball to somebody and they're throwing some kind of question to you you can't find a good answer for, you feel embarrassed about the whole thing, then you want to go home and really pray and seek the Lord and get the book down until you know what it stands for. I went to my pastor and asked him about it. Brother Earl Tool, I want him to help me with it. The next time I come up with just one of those fellows, I had some ammunition ready to go. If you'll stand, I'm going to read you latter part of this. I notice in the seven churches of Asia, everyone had something to overcome. And preacher friend of mine, pastor friend, every one of those were against the pastor for allowing this in the church. That's what it was for. And don't forget, he said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. That's pretty sobering. But he said, but you can overcome and I'll help you to overcome. I'll help you to clean it out of the church. I'll be the one that'll purge your floor for you. But notice the first church, he knows this all their tribulations, their troubles, their faithfulness, and the whole thing. And uh, he gives a quite a little, a little degree of, uh, of commendation to them. But one thing they lacked, that was they didn't have their first love. Notice he promised, I'll give you a crown of life if you'll overcome it. The next church, it had a lot of sin in it, a lot of problems inside of it. He said, if you'll overcome it, I'll give you the hidden manna. I'll, I'll give you the white stone. The next church... It had all these problems and false teachings and false doctrines in it. He said, if you'll overcome and you'll keep my word unto the end, I'll give you power over the nations. Sardis, if you'll overcome, I'll clothe you in white linen. I won't blot your name out of the book. And then he said to the next church, hold your crown. Don't let no man take it. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God. The one that amazes me the most is the Laodicean church. He wasn't even inside. He said, if you'll overcome your lukewarmness, your pride, and all of these things in here, he said, if you'll do that, I'll let you sit with me in my throne. Every church had to overcome. Every church, every person has got to overcome. Whatever you're overcoming, the reward is far greater than anything you're going to go through. I'd like to have the Lord to help you today. And I know we've had a lot of good prayer services, and I appreciate that. And I'm not going to close with a long prayer service unless you want to pray. What I've given you, I wish you'd get the tape and go back over it when you get home. Do what you want to here. I'm not saying you can't. But I say this one fact. If you really want to learn to know Jesus Christ, you've got to get some convictions about some things. You've got to overcome some problems. You've got to overcome these matters. And when God builds you strong enough to overcome where you are now, young lady and young man, you will be prepared for the great work that's ahead of us as far as the church is concerned. Jesus, I want you to work right now in this place. Every one of these young people have a burden. They want to live for God. They're here because they love you, Jesus. We don't always know how much strength we've got. We don't know where we're weak. We sometimes feel that we're strong, and then we other times feel that we're weak and cannot overcome. But I'm praying that faith would grip their heart that they will learn of you. You will let them learn of you, Jesus. Teach them the ways. Help them to know you, Lord, until their lives are being transformed, that they'll be more than a conqueror. They'll be an overcomer. They'll learn of you, Jesus, and serve you with a whole heart. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
within our hearts. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God, put those convictions in me. Give me convictions, God. God, help me take a stand. God, help me take a stand. Hallelujah. 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 You got to stand for something, young people, because if you don't, you fall for anything. You got to stand for something. You've got to make up in your mind that I love this thing. I believe it, and I'm going to live it. Amen. Amen. We're so thankful for Brother Price ministering to us. To take his advice. Get the tape. Take it home. Chew on it. Amen. It would be better, don't forget, also tomorrow at 1 o'clock, any young men that are aspiring in the ministry or seeking or are young ministers, we will be having a special session with Brother Price Brother Cantrell, at 1 o'clock tomorrow, that's for all young men that are, that are feeling a touch of the Lord on your life, please meet with us. It's at 1 o'clock in the grape room tomorrow Thursday. Amen. You will definitely be impacted by the Word of God. Hallelujah. God bless you. Excuse me for interrupting. We have had several requests uh, for the pizza bash tonight. We have sold out of tickets yesterday evening. We have tried to do everything we can to accommodate everybody, and it's just we're just uh, to capacity. However, we're going to contact uh, those making the pizza, the uh, Pizza Hut, and we're also going to try to accommodate 50 more people in the uh, pizza bash tonight. Brother Lopez has just went back to the to the booth. Uh, please, uh, we're sorry we just can't have everybody. But no, we've already exceeded our usual limit by 100, so now we're going to expand it 50 more. And if you want one of those 
50 tickets, you need to go back to the booth right after you leave here and see uh, Brother Lopez. Everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed. We'll see you at Singspiration.